So um, it's not what I thought I was going to do, but this week the two practices that I want to focus on are, um, first of all, reading, and then the second one is about enjoying creation. And the one that I want to spend the most of our, our remaining time on is to do with reading. As I was sitting with mum, I've also spent time reading uh, alongside her. And it has been reading scripture, it's been reading spiritual, um, theological resources, uh, whatever way you want to describe it. And, and one of my go-to people, one of the people that I find most helpful is a man called A.W. Tozer. And his life was a life of pressing into worshipping God with every fibre of his being. And, and uh, so I want to share a few things that, that I found really helpful from what he said to give you a context, because what I felt was the Lord was saying is there's no point in doing these practices if you don't get the heart behind what they're about. There's no point in just doing them because it's a better thing to do than what you were doing before. It's actually what's the heart behind this. And the heart behind this is that we would fall in love with Jesus more deeply than ever before. That we would experience his love for us in ways that we haven't before. And that we would know more clearly how to respond to that love. And so um, I want to read to you Psalm 45. Uh, just one verse, verse 11. It's a, it's a wedding psalm. It's a psalm that um, it has uh, music that's designated that goes with it. And, and it's obvious that it's the wedding of a king. And weddings in those days weren't, weren't love marriages the way um, we would describe them today. They were, they were virtually always arranged marriages. And in this example, it's an arranged marriage between the king and, and, and some a woman. And, um, and verse 11 says this, the king is enthralled by your beauty. The psalmist is singing to the bride. The king is enthralled by your beauty. To be enthralled is to be uh, filled with delight and wonder at something. To be enthralled is to be fascinated by what you're looking at, to be captivated by it. And so what this psalm is saying is the king, Jesus, is enthralled, is, is, is captivated by you and by me, by our beauty. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. It's God loves you. He, he really loves you. He loves you more than you can possibly ever imagine in a love beyond anything that you could ever offer to anybody else. And, uh, and so the, the psalmist goes on to say, the king is enthralled by your beauty. Honour him, for he is your Lord. And so it's saying to the bride, um, effectively, can you see how much he loves you? Over to you. How are you going to respond? And, and what Tozer does is he, he describes some components of, of what our response should look like as we seek to respond to the King of Kings, Jesus, being enthralled with us, delighting in us. And so this is what Tozer talks about. He says, worship is not primarily about feelings, but anyone who says, that they worship God and yet they don't experience emotion in relation to God, does not worship him. It's not about feelings, but if we don't get emotional about God, he is convinced, and so would I be, that actually we're not worshipping him. If we, if we love him in our minds, if we love what we know about him, we haven't, we haven't gone to worship yet. We haven't reached worship. Tozer describes worship as an attitude or a state of mind that automatically carries with it this mysterious feeling of our hearts that we call love. Worship involves an emotional connection with what we worship and uh, the closest thing that we can call it is love. He, he says that feeling is not as intense all the time. 
it's not as intense for example the first time I ever uh, met Marashina and decided that this was somebody that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with the intensity of how I felt about her isn't the same today I love her more deeply than ever before but it's a different it's a more mature love than than the emotional connection that was there right at the beginning um, the way I love our boys, our two boys, um, is is deeper and I'm more delighted in who they've become as, as young men of God and, and how they honour the women who they love in their lives. Uh, I, I couldn't be more delighted, but the intensity is not the same as when they were first born or certain moments uh, that uh, where they're, they were achieving something in life and the intensity of love that I felt with them. Uh, for them was 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 almost overwhelming, um, and so he's saying that this intensity will will ebb and flow, but there needs to be there needs to be an emotional engagement for it to be worship. I'm emotionally connected to Marashina. I'm emotionally connected to our boys. I'm emotionally connected to our first grandchild, um, Jonathan and Elise, first first child. And, and I feel intense emotion at times. But what Tozer's saying is, worship is that, but so much more. So he's enthralled with us. How do we honour him? And so Tozer highlights four components, and I want to I briefly mention them to you. The first thing is, and I think this is really important, because we live in a context where we struggle to trust anybody because we don't feel as if they're speaking truthfully to us and um, we feel about we feel it about the government we feel it about um, our work colleagues we feel it about um, thing, promises that are made to us and all sorts of different um, aspects of life and, and we're not sure that we can trust them we live in a culture where increasingly uh, truth seems to be uh, something that is from yesteryear uh, but what Tozer says is uh, the honouring God starts with a boundless confidence in his character. A boundless confidence in his character. God is completely and utterly trustworthy. There's nothing fake about him. He always keeps his promises. There's no promise he makes that he can't keep. And so what we need to do is to rescue our concept of who God is because it's been so diminished by the culture in which we live, by what our view of truth has become, by what we think about character in other people and how important that is. So first of all, we honour him by, by having a boundless confidence in his character. That's more than just knowing it to be true. It's we trust we're confident that it's true and therefore we're prepared to put weight on it. We're prepared to, to place things of importance on it for us. And so I want to um, just stop for a moment and uh, to recommend some resources. Uh, so this practice is about, about reading, about reading spiritual resources. And um, there are so many. I talked about A.W. Tozer and what an impact he's been on me as I've read about discovering more about who God is and, and growing in confidence about who God is. But there, there, are, there are one or two people in particular who have really opened up my world in this area. And um, I can't show you the book because, as you can see, it appears uh, back to front whenever you see it. But the title is God's Passion for You. And it's by a guy called Sam Storms. I just want to read the little bit on the back. God delights in you. Does it sound too good to be true? You know you're not good enough. You know you can't earn his love. Yet he loves you with unwavering passion. And what Sam Storms does is he uses examples from scripture and from church history and from the time whenever he wrote the book, which was a few years ago now. And he reveals through those sources the depths of God's pleasure in his people. As he says, a pleasure that springs from his very own nature 
and purposes. God does not wait for us to change before he will love us, yet his love is the very best agent for change in us once we have let it take root. And so Sam Storms, God's passion for you. Uh, the other person that I want to recommend is uh, a guy called Mike Bickle. I started this series of faith builders by talking about the, the, the spiritual legacy of the abbey, the monastery that was built in Bangor, and, uh, and how they would have engaged in 24-7 prayer. I've recommended the Lectio 365, which is developed by Pete Gregg and the 24-7 prayer movement. And hopefully you've been finding that helpful. Mike Bickle is, uh, he was the leader of a church at the age of 20 in Kansas City. And for many years now, he's been the, the leader of a 24-7 prayer movement called the International House of Prayer based in Kansas City. And they have engaged in unceasing prayer for many years. And uh, he was the first person that I encountered who, who had captured God's love for him in a way that I hadn't noticed in anybody else before. And, uh, and so there's two books that I want to talk about of his and recommend them to you. The first one is called The Pleasures of Loving God. The Pleasures of Loving God. And I want to read a little bit from the introduction. People often ask me the question, he says, why are you happy all the time? They ask me this because they really can't understand how a person can be can really just be happy. But I am all of the time. You really will seldom see me without a smile on my face. No matter what's going on, I just have a great time. Everyone I meet seems to be curious about what my secret to happiness is. In fact, they often ask my wife and people I work with every day if I'm really happy all of the time. Their answer is always the same. Yes, he really is. He really is just happy all of the time. It seems that everybody is surprised when I tell them the secret to my happiness. Actually, it's not any secret at all. In fact, I love to tell people why I'm so happy. The truth is that I am ecstatically happy because I know that God likes me. I'm happy all of the time because I am absolutely certain that he does. In fact, I even know that I am God's favourite. Now, that may sound arrogant to you, but it really isn't. God has lots of favourites. In fact, I'm sure that you're God's favourite too. You're not just one of his favourites, but you really, really are his very, very favourite. That doesn't detract from the fact that I am God's favourite though. So because I know that I'm God's favourite person and because I know that he really, really likes me, I go through life just as happy as happy can be. He goes on to say, when you're in love, it's so easy to do things for your lover. Spending time with God, because he's talking about God as his love relationship isn't a big sacrifice. In fact, it isn't a sacrifice at all because it's something you want to do. And beyond that, there isn't anything you would rather be doing. He goes on to say, I'm so excited now because I get to spend time with the Lord all day long because of this 24 seven house of prayer that he's just opened. And in this book, he unpacks this love that God has for us, how much he likes us, how much he is enthralled, to use the words of Psalm 45, verse 11 with us. That he is a king who is a bridegroom who loves each one of us as his bride and the church as the bride that he is in a covenant relationship with. And so I really recommend The Pleasures of Loving God. And then one other of his books, and this is called Passion for Jesus. And uh, again, I want to read a little bit from Passion for Jesus. And this is again from the introduction and it's entitled An Affectionate God. No one can come face to face with what God is like and ever be the same. 
Seeing his true image touches the depths of our temperament, bringing us to spiritual wholeness and maturity. Beholding the glory of who he is and what he has done renews our minds, strengthens us and transforms us. In John 8, 32, Jesus tells us that we will know the truth and the truth will set us free. We long to be free emotionally and spiritually, yet Jesus says that freedom comes with knowing the truth. And we must start where Jesus says to start. Since knowing the truth sets us free, then what we know has a great impact on our emotional makeup. Thus, the way to our emotions is through our minds. What truths must we know to be free? First and most important, who is God? What is he like? What kind of personality does he have? Our ideas about God, who he is and what he is like, come naturally through our relationships with earthly authority figures. When these are distorted, so are our ideas about God. He goes on to say, I believe the greatest problem in the church is that we have an entirely inadequate and distorted idea of God's heart. We can experience short-term renewal through prayer and ministry, but to achieve long-term renewal and freedom, we must change our ideas about who God is. He says the second truth that we must know to be set free is who we are in God. Both of these truths are vital to our living full and complete lives. But here, this book is about focusing on who God is. God will satisfy, he says, our hungry hearts when he reveals himself to us as we encounter the awesome holiness and power of his personality, we will have the power to overcome temptation. A revelation of the true knowledge of our King will renew the body of Christ from the inside out. There are four key elements, he says, of the gospel that will lead believers to that revelation. The first is who God is. Secondly, what he has done. Third, what we can receive. And fourth, what we should do. The church places most of its emphasis, he says, on the last three. What God has done for us in Christ, the forgiveness and inheritance we receive as adopted children, and what we should do to receive and walk in them. We need to continue preaching those things faithfully, but the foundational element, who God is, is tragically absent in many of our messages. The great need of this hour is for 10,000 preachers and teachers who are consumed with the character and personality of God. I'm not advocating imbalance, but it is the true knowledge of God that makes the rest of the message so significant. A church that has lost the, the knowledge of the incredible personality of God will be shallow, bored and passionless. This is not a book filled with formulas such as how to achieve passionate Christianity in 10 easy steps. Instead, it has to do with the powerful concrete connection between knowing the truth about who God is and experiencing affection and passion in our hearts for him. It is the revelation of God's passionate love and affection for us that awakens ever deepening feelings of love and passion for him. Simply put, we love him because he first loved us. 1 John 4.19 These two books by Mike Bickle transformed my understanding of who God is. And I believe that they can do that for you too. Because what Tozer is talking about is that worship, true worship, is a, an emotional heart engagement with this person who has opened the possibility of relationship, who longs that we would recognise just how much he loves us and who wants us to respond to that love by honouring him. So back to uh, our teaching. Second thing is uh, we honour him by admiring him. We admire him because of, of who he is. David Watson, uh, 
he's he's dead quite a while now but he was a rector in the church of england a canon and he was a tremendous evangelist uh, and had a, a great teaching ministry in many parts of the world and he regularly would have talked about god's love for us but he would also have talked about um, two ways in which we respond to that love uh, that we honor god by our love back to him but he said that for the vast majority of christians the love that they express to God is a love born out of gratitude because of what God had done for them. Is that true of you? I know at times in the past it was certainly true of me that, that I loved God, but, but the love was out of gratitude for what he'd done for me. David Watson talked about uh, that as it, it is real love, it's authentic love, but it's a lesser love if it's based on gratitude for who for what god has done for us or is doing for us in our lives at the minute or how we feel about what god's doing then it's a lesser love it's a less adequate love if you like tozer and watson are both talking about cultivating a love for god that is based not simply on what he has done and is doing but on who he is. And so uh, Tozer uses the word excellence and, and, and uh, Watson, I think, mirrors it. And uh, that God is excellent and we recognise his excellence. We recognise the beauty in who he is for who he is. If I was to reduce it to a sporting analogy, uh, I would talk about the difference between uh, my my current teams that I support um, and, and I support them out of a commitment to them because of my identity. I support them out of a loyalty because I've supported them for years. And so, for example, in rugby terms, it would be Ulster in Ireland because I'm an Ulsterman and an Irishman. In football terms, I support Manchester United because I started supporting them whenever they were one, if not the team to, to watch in terms of their exciting brand of play. And um, and so that that love that I have for them um, comes out of uh, connectedness because of who I am. But if I was to just love a team because of a love for the game, the particular sport, then it wouldn't be Ulster or Ireland that I would support in rugby terms. It would probably be Saracens or Leinster or in international terms, uh, the way... Uh, the way some of the, the um, for example, Japan at the World Cup played with such an intensity and joy and abandonment, um, or the way the All Blacks are just consistently excellent in their skill level and in their intensity. Um, if it was in football terms, much as I hate to admit it, uh, if it was for the love of the game, Liverpool are the team to watch. The, there is a beauty about the way that they go about playing the beautiful game. And and so that's that's a bit of the it's a it's a poor analogy, but it's the difference between this lesser love that comes from some sort of connectedness in us or something that we have uh, gratitude for, and a love that's based on something that's beyond something that is to do with seeing a more excellent version of the way things are meant to be, and so God is the most excellent person. God is love. And love is the most excellent way, Paul talks about. And so when we look at God, we see love. We see truth. We see justice. We see all of, the, all of these virtues and qualities in who he is. And we see them in the person of Jesus. And so what we're being called into and what worship is about is, is, uh, is us cultivating that greater love and admiration for who God is, not just for what we get out of it. And what Tozer says is that that leads to the third component in relation to our love of God. And that third component is, uh, the word that he uses is fascination. That uh, it's a, it's a, it, while a love of God surpasses any other form of love, um, that that what we what we want is to get to the place where 
God so captivates us that we're fascinated by him, that he, that he, he demands, compels us to want to spend more time with him. And uh, it's interesting that the word fascination, actually uh, neuroscientists would say it's got a neurological uh, um, understanding that is about a state of our minds where our mind has an intense focus on something. And so it's like we give our complete attention to something, that it captivates us so that everything else, captivates us so that everything else just settles to the side perhaps even disappears altogether, that to be fascinated by something brings confidence and clarity because nothing else matters. Um, probably in relationship terms for us as human beings, uh, falling in love is, is probably the closest that it, it gets to because whenever you fall in love with someone, everything changes and things that used to be important uh, are not so important anymore or uh, the things that you want to prioritise are all about this person that, that you've become fascinated with. And so that's what Tozer talks about. He talks about this third component is that um, knowing that we can trust God, we can have complete and utter confidence in God, admiring the excellence of who he is in his person will cause us to long to, be, to become more and more focused on spending time with him and everything else starts to fall into place around that because it's all about uh, being compelled by the love of God and scripture talks about that actually another word you could use is enthralled and so so just as the king is enthralled with his bride God is enthralled with us so one of the ways that we honor him is to give back to him the love in best in the best way we can that he already offers to us we love him because he first loved us, as Mike Bickle reminds us from First John. And the the fourth component that I want to mention is, uh, and that Tozer talks about, is is that God wants us to, to even more than be fascinated by him. He wants us to adore him. Now, adore is a word that um, is a bit like love; that it's often uh, misused and so we talk about oh I adore that outfit you're wearing or or I adore what you've done with the place um, uh, we, we use adore as a way of describing something that says you know oh I love that I just love that um, but adore is so much more adore uh, the Latin word that, that adore comes from is is the word for worship and and so what Tozer is saying is is that to adore God is to offer deep love that leads to acts of worship. That to adore something isn't just, it doesn't just end there. What adoration does is it causes you to change the way you act in light of it. It's not something that you can make somebody do. It's not something that you can manipulate. Um, you can't just create a great worship atmosphere or choose a mode of worship songs or or even use wonderful words in our prayers of adoration. All of those things are they're not bad things, but, but we can't manipulate somebody into adoring God. It just doesn't work like that. The, the best way of thinking about it, perhaps, again, to use a, a human analogy, is a young couple have their first child. And uh, they've been looking forward to this child being born and they're excited about it. Um, but life doesn't really change that much until the child is born. And whenever the baby's born, um, all of a sudden everything changes. Uh, that they, they would use the language of a door, and, and we do too. We've just had our, our first grandchild, our first granddaughter. And, um, and we talk about, isn't she adorable? And... And it's because of the level of love that we feel towards her. And the level of love that they have for her is expressed in all sorts of ways that, that they, they, just, they just gaze upon her. They are delighted in everything that they see about her, her growing personality and just everything about her. And, and so, so life 
has completely been reoriented, that they will do whatever they need to do to be able to love and to care for and to provide for this bundle of life. And, uh, and that's, that captures something of what adoration should do in us, that whenever we fall in love with God, and whenever it impacts our hearts in the way that God desires and, and worship really implies, what it does is it changes the things that, that are important. And so, so everything starts to get reoriented in our lives. It's not that like a baby, God doesn't need anything from us. We can't, we can't provide anything that God needs in that sense. He doesn't depend on us in any shape or form. But he desires that we would respond in a way that honours him. He desires that we would respond in a way that um, uh, we delight him because we do the things that he desires us to do. And so our example in that is Jesus, that we look at the life of Jesus and we see how he adored his father and how he did only what his father wanted him to do. And so his response was to live a life of complete 100% never made a mistake, obedience. And so adoration in worship is about us longing and desiring and doing everything we can to encourage our thinking, uh, that our thinking would be right, that our actions would be appropriate so that we would be bringing honour to the name of Jesus, that we would be doing exactly what the psalmist is talking about, the king is enthralled by your beauty. Honour him, for he is your Lord. I want to highlight a couple more resources that um, might help you in that. And th these are only samples. These are only some of the ones that I had to hand. Um, the, uh, there are many others that, depending on, on where you're at and, and what decisions you're wanting to to reflect on there's there's loads and loads and loads of books and feel free to contact me if you're wanting some advice and some of those but i want to recommend a couple and um, one is what does your soul love and it's eight questions that reveal god's work in you it's written by jim and alan fadling uh, jim and alan fadling and so i want to read a little bit of what it says embarking on a journey of transformation involves Remaining awake to a deeper level of reality that is always present. Remaining on this journey requires a simpler God focus. These eight questions about transformation can help us cultivate this kind of deeper awareness and soul focus. These paths help keep us on the journey of transformation. They keep us in the presence of the transforming one. Here's some of the things that they talk about. Uh, what do you really want? What are your desires? What is getting in your way? What things are resisting you? And you, you'll have been, if you're truly engaging in this process, you'll be aware, you're increasingly aware of the things that are getting in your way of pursuing this love relationship with God. What are you hiding or trying to hide? You're, you're not hiding it from God because he knows, but... But what are you hiding from, from really addressing yourself, bringing into the open? What is most real to you? It's one thing to, to have thoughts in your head or to read things in, uh, in scripture, but do you really believe them? Are they true? Are you prepared to place your weight upon them, to make life decisions based on them? How are you suffering? What are you afraid of? What are you clinging to? Going back to a bit of what Mike Bickle was talking about, what is your soul love? And so they ask these eight questions and they unpack what that means and, and what it might look like and how you can discover more for yourself. Uh, what does your soul love? And it's a really helpful book in, in, in pushing in to God. And then the last one that I want to recommend is You Are What You Love, The Spiritual Power of Habit. And it's by James K. A. Smith. And again, I want to just highlight a couple of things. Um, this is uh, 
this is a it's a great book um, and it, it's a, li a little bit more intellectual in terms of the way that he addresses and engages with these things and um, but he says who and what we worship fundamentally shape our hearts we may not realize however the ways our hearts are taught to love rival gods instead of the one for whom we were made and he goes on to talk about how culture shapes us and i think one of the benefits of this lockdown is that we our culture has changed overnight we're in this uh, in between uh, where where we've become more conscious of what we're doing and why we're doing it we think about it in a way that often in a cultural context you don't you just take it as that's the way it is and so it's quite a good uh, time to read you are what you love and and again what he talks about is uh, just about how we can guard our hearts and how we can teach our children well and um, and how uh, our life can become the uh, a life that loves the things that God loves because it's so easy for us to be captivated by the culture around us and to love the things that other people and that this culture loves and for us to take that as being normal and that's the opposite of what loving God looks like in many circumstances and so uh, the the practice that I'm talking about is about reading and uh, using the resources that are available uh, through through ebooks or through uh, hard copies so that you can uh, read and reflect that you might grow in what I'm going to I'm recommending is your your knowledge of who God is and how much he loves you and how you can increase the way and improve the way that you love him in response. And then the, the second practice that I want to finish with is, is uh, the practice of enjoying creation. And I'm just going to say a few words about that because it's, it's, it's more straightforward to get your, your head around. That all around us is the beauty of creation. That God, it's, it's recognising that God is the one who made it. And it's taking time to recognise the beauty that is in it. Uh, the, the, the minutest details, the, the fragrances. As I walk the dog at night, there's a particular corner that I turn. And, and I have no idea about, about gardening or flowers. But, but there is this bush that is part of the hedge. And, and it is there's a fragrance that comes and every time I walk past it I am just conscious of the the, the beauty of that fragrance and and every time I, I, I catch it I stop and I, and I and I smell for a little bit longer before moving on because it's it's, it's just beautiful and then I walk on down to uh, Ballyhome Esplanade and and I hear the lapping of the water as the tide is coming in or out, depending on, on what time of the day it is. And all the time I'm experiencing what is usually a gentle breeze, sometimes bracing on my face. And so what I encourage you to do is to enjoy the good weather that we're having, uh, to be out and and enjoying this nature that God has created for us, but being aware of the fact that it's God who has given it to us as a gift and and as we experience it and as we notice the various aspects about it is giving thanks to God for it recognizing just how much he loves us that he would place us in in such a wonderful creation and so uh, be blessed this week stay safe and uh, and I encourage you to keep pressing in to God so that you might learn to love him more fully.